the the Ten Commandments list, I call it, and the and the profiling. I say, wow, he hit the nail on his head. The profiling is number one issue here, because if you don't, All right, well, let me explain. Okay, you're you're a former Israeli uh, air marshal, and you're saying racial profiling is the only thing that'll save us. I happen to know that you use profiling that goes beyond racial profiling. You use profiling per se, meaning not just racial. Am I correct? Yeah, we use we use we we just identify the the, the beast and say, hey, the beast looks like that, has, has eight heads or whatever. And you cannot say it doesn't. And the moment the moment you ignore it, you have a problem. You have. A I got to tell you, Ari, this is funny. What in what years were you a, uh, an Israeli sky marshal? I was in the year seventy five, uh, pushed to eight years up. And I <laughs> Wait, no, this is hilariously funny. In nineteen seventy eight, I went to Israel for the first time with my two young children, my wife and two young children. I was profiled at the airport because I had long hair. I looked like Charles Manson, and they immediately pulled us aside. In fact, they in inspected my poor daughter's diaper. Do you know that? Yeah, I can't, I can't. No, In order for me to get on El Al, they put us through some dr grilling, and I'm not a Muslim, so I went through the profiling. I laughed when they did it. I figured, look, this is their their technique. I, I got nothing to hide. I didn't care. But they used profiling on me. They thought I was a terrorist because I had long hair and a beard. The moment you, you, you just just bring some suspicious suspicion, they, 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 they ask you so many questions. And by the way, something very interesting, those years, now, when you travel the world, they ask you this main question: Did you transfer something to to somebody? Did somebody give you something? This happened in 1975, or a little bit below that. It was in Switzerland, and I was in that in, in that time. A woman came; she was pregnant. She was holding a big uh, boombox, and for some reason, the, the the person didn't like the whole picture, and they start asking her question questions. And turned to be that her Palestinian husband gave her a bomb that will activate it high up in 30,000 feet oh. with his baby in her belly. And she was supposed to be exploded, to be exploded with the Israeli airline, you know. And he That's unbelievable. <laughs> I would say it's unbelievable, except it's, it's uh, unfortunately too believable. They have no respect for human life. That's a really weird death cult, that is. Ari, let me send you the only thing I can send you for Hanukkah, which is a copy of Government Zero. Stay on the line. For the Jewish listeners, you know, uh, Hanukkah begins Sunday night. It sounds like a child's holiday, but it has some kind of spiritual value to people who have studied what it means. And Actually, I should tell you in about 30 seconds or less, it's one of the few holidays I, as a sort of non-religious individual, still like. I mean, you don't know, somebody's up there for sure. For sure, there's somebody created this whole mess that we're in. And uh, I, I'll tell you the Hanukkah story another time. I wanted to go into another thing about God for one second. I laid in bed this morning and got had another thought. I said, if there really is a God in heaven, why does he let a thing like this happen? How does he let these two Muslim maniacs, again, Muslim maniacs, go and slaughter innocent people without who had no chance to defend themselves? There was no chance to fight back. Nobody had a gun. They were developmentally disabled or the, the nice people who worked in there. They shot them like fish in a barrel. Why would a God, a just God, let a thing like this happen? Well, there's so many answers that you can come up with tragedies like this, and religious people always have an answer. I'm not a religious person, so I don't have that kind of answer. I have a sort of pragmatic answer, and here's my sort of pragmatic answer. God is trying to awaken America before it's too late. God is literally speaking to you through these horrific acts, warning you that you have... I got to put it in such a way that's not a career killer that you have either naive liberals running things or fellow travelers running things or outright enemies running the country. And they're trying to warn you that you must defend yourself, protect yourself. And by all means, you better you better understand that there's a whole year left for this demon in the White House to undo everything that's going to save us a whole year. This man is relentless in his pursuit of chaos. And so maybe God wants to awaken us. I mean, I heard the same kind of argument, which I thought was ludicrous at one point, by uh, religious people when I would ask them. I challenged them point blank. 
You tell me there's a God in heaven. How did he let the, the, the Germans kill six million Jews and nine million others? How did he let him slaughter? How did they let the Germans slaughter three million Jews? What kind of just God would do that? I heard every answer in the book. And I met Israelis who told me that they were religious before the Holocaust and became warriors after the Holocaust. I heard everything. I heard every possible answer to every question you can imagine. All I know is that you can have an Uzi in one hand and a Bible in the other. It's not either or, it's both and. It's that simple. You can hedge your bet. Make believe you're at Las Vegas. Have a Bible in one hand, whatever your religion is, and have a weapon in the other hand, because that's all you can do. You've got you to gotta hedge your bet. How do we know if there's a God or not? There's no proof. Well, there is proof if you're religious, and there's no proof if you're not religious. Does it matter one way or the other? If it's one of your innocent relatives who's just been butchered by these animals? Does it really matter? You're going to tell me you're going to find God's going to give you some salvation today? Going and crying in a church is going to make you feel better? Or going in a synagogue after another slaughter in Israel is going to make them feel better? I don't know. I don't have an answer to any of these questions. I mean, each individual has to cope with tragedy and, and horror and uh, terrorism in their own way, and the Israelis probably know more about it than I do. I don't live there. I almost lived there, but I don't live there. I decided not to, and I told you that story once. I went there in that year of 78. I was going to move to Israel for a, a whole host of reasons. The main was affirmative action had kept me out of my chosen profession, which was being a professor, even though I had written six books and I had a first-rate PhD with a 3.9 index out of four. I was a perfect candidate to be a great professor, but they were only hiring women, uh, minorities and illegal aliens at the time. So I was so infuriated by it because I had a very, very good background uh, that the, the, the chairman or whatever he was of, of Hebrew University, who happened to be a brilliant worldwide, brilliant chemist, invited me to Israel. And I went there, listen to this, very interesting. He said, I can give you a two-year fellowship in your field of medicinal chemistry, ethnobotany, and of all things, he says, you're going to work on the West Bank with the Arabs, collecting plants and asking their folk healing. <laughs> Thank God I didn't get the fellowship. But that's a separate story to that one. But let me tell you how spiritual this story really is. It just as a little side note, if you're interested in the story. As is my habit, the wife and children were sleeping in the, the, um, the Jerusalem YMHA, YMCA. Sorry. Beautiful building, by the way. And I went for a walk that night on the cobblestone streets to commune with the spirits of the city, to feel the city. And I heard my deceased father, who had died eight years before, speak to me. And I, said, I didn't mean he came down in the street. I'm not Jimmy Carter. I don't, I don't drink uh, lighter fluid and wave snakes over my head. I'm saying I heard my father speak to me sort of in my own mind. And he said to me, I was an immigrant to America. Why would you want to make your son an immigrant to another land? I went home the next day. I'll be back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. Your Savage Nation is sponsored by SwissAmerica.com. It's the only company I trust for tangible assets, gold and silver. Call 800 B U I C O. All right, so let's begin with... Um, Clip number five, where Obama says we don't know why this happened. Listen to the ludicrous statement that your president makes in five. At this stage, we do not yet know uh, why this terrible event occurred. Uh, we do know that uh, the two uh, individuals who were killed uh, were equipped with uh, weapons uh, and uh, All right, let's stop right here. The guy is, is, is a, such an unskilled liar that he can't even listen to anymore. Everything he says is so full of holes, equipped with weapons. They're also equipped with racial hatred. You could say they were also equipped with religious hatred. You could also say they were equipped with uh, praying six times a day. You could blame that if you wanted, couldn't you? So why would you focus on guns? It was guns that saved everyone else. The police guns. <laughs> That's what saved the rest of the people from a... You know, remember when they left the massacre scene, they moved away very slowly? I kept saying, where's the car, where's the car, where's the car? How could they not find it? Where's the helicopter? I kept saying, "Where? what do you mean the car is missing? I couldn't understand it. Then it came out an hour later that the black SUV left at a very slow pace. So I said to myself, I know what they're doing. They're mocking the police, but they weren't mocking the police. Looking back now, what they were doing was they were trying to have the police follow them because they wanted a massive shootout. 
That's what their instructors in Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, or other some other hellhole told them to do. Go out in flames. Go out with as big a shootout as you can. The virgins are awaiting you. Just make it as dramatic as you can. More bullets better. More mayhem better. Sh make it a big shootout. A big shootout. That's what they were told. Now, the same president a week ago told us that there's no credible threat. Do you have that, Robert? This is unbelievable. Any other society would fire a CEO like this. The next minute they demand, out, 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 take all of your, your, your cohorts with you, out, listen to this. Anytime there's an event, we learn something from it. Now, right now, we know of no specific and credible intelligence indicating a plot on the homeland. Stop. That was last week, after the last Muslim mayhem. So that means he's failed us. That means all our, all our intelligence agencies are full of holes. They failed us. We are the we are the stockholders. We want a new CEO. We want a new CEO, and we want new leadership in every department in this country. But you're not going to get it because we live in a dictatorship. If we lived in a participatory democracy, I can guarantee you there would be a call for a new election tomorrow, and this man wouldn't be here anymore. There'd be a wholesale change of administration. I'd be remiss if I didn't play this for you. Yesterday, I was the first one hours before everyone else to name the shooter six hours before mainstream media. Play clip 21, please. This comes to us from Twitter News on the Minute. Breaking news. A man named Farouk Saeed is a possible suspect off the police scanner. A man named Farouk Saeed is a possible suspect. Again, this is only speculation, but it's being reported right now from Twitter at News on the Minute. A man named Farouk Saeed is a possible suspect in this cowardly shooting at this disability center. This is a very disturbing story. They walked into the conference room with three rifles and opened fire. Now, there's one little disturbing detail, one tiny one that may not be related. Some people were at a Christmas party. Now, you could put two and two together. You start piecing the evidence together if you're a crime scene investigator. Hmm, three men unidentified. Hmm, Christmas party, Farouk Saeed. Farouk Saeed, hmm. I wonder, I just wonder, am I allowed to even think that? Well, you wouldn't dare say it to your superior. No, if you work for DHS, you would never kick that up to who you report to. No, 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 you would never say that because you'd lose your job. So don't even suggest it if you're in the DHS or the FBI. Sit there like a dummy and make believe you don't know. Wait for the geniuses at the top to tell you what to think. Wait until the great president gives a speech before you say anything about who possibly could have done this or where they're hiding. At least that's what I'm thinking. That was yesterday, six hours before everyone else. I took the chance. Unfortunately, I was right. And it was because I felt that as a commentator... I had not only the right, but the responsibility to my audience to comment on that ongoing tragedy as honestly as I could. It's all I've got to offer you, nothing else. I have no lipstick. I have no nylons. I have no M Manalo shoes. In other words, I don't work for Fox News. This is the Savage Nation. Let's pray for a better tomorrow. Thank you for listening, and please do check out Government Zero.